So the floor is ready uh, for our second topic today, GDPR and ethical issues with social media data. So uh, Katrin and Oliver, uh, it's all yours. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank um, you. Um, <laughs> yeah, my name is Katrin Vella. And my name is and, Oliver Wattela. Uh, <laughs> and we both work at uh, GESIS, which is the Leibniz Institute for the Social Sciences. Typically, we would be based in Cologne, but at the moment, we're a bit spread uh, in our home office uh, situations. Um, okay, and Oliver is uh, moving on the slides, so maybe we can just move on to the next one already. Yeah. Um, so our topic is um, GDPR and social media ethics. Um, we have to jump a step back in time. Um, social media research and data collected from uh, social media platforms is kind of the, the new thing in different research areas. Um, when I started working in that field, uh, so approximately 2013-14, um, there was a time when not everyone realized the value of this kind of data. So why should we data social media platforms at all. When the Library of Congress announced, uh, also I think in 2014, that they would archive every single tweet that has ever been tweeted, quite some skeptical reactions to that. So um, the quote you're seeing here is something that a um, reader wrote on a um, newspaper site and to the announcement of, of the Library of Congress. Uh, doing this kind of thing. Um, so they were questioning, why, why do they do that? Do they not realize that 99% of tweets are worthless babble um, that read something like, just woke up, going to Starbucks now, getting latte. And um, since then, the situation has changed fundamentally. When the Library of Congress announced that they are not going to collect all tweets in the future so that they just uh, change to important collections, there was some serious question whether this is the right decision now that uh, Twitter is so important and also used by um, presidents and uh, political actors and so on. So there has been a change in the public perception of the value of this data, but there also, next slide, um, has been uh, yeah, a perception of this value from a research perspective. So there are various uh, online platforms that produce various types of data. So this is just... Um, some snapshot of what happens in an internet minute um, on some of the more popular platforms. But there are also niche platforms that are not listed here for special interest groups. And um, next slide. These are being used in various research areas already. So um, I'm, I'm based in an interdisciplinary department on computational social science and um, so a lot of people in, in this area have a background in communication science, for example, in computer science, but also in linguistics. So people who are interested in language change find uh, data from social media platforms uh, specifically valuable. Um, there is um, educational science research in this area, a lot of sociology, but also topics like medical studies. Now that we are in this pandemic situation, there's a lot of... Um, uh, interest in how medical interventions, how prevention measures for um, spread of the virus can be communicated in, in social media, for example, and how people react to that. Uh, there are physicists being interested more in the network structure of things uh, and a lot more disciplines. And they all already use data collected from social media platforms, from other online communication platforms as the source of their studies. Next slide. There's a lot of challenges to that. And the challenge we will focus on in our talk today and uh, on Thursday um, is that a lot of this data is really sensitive. So people share images, text, information about themselves on various kinds of platforms. Um, it's really sensitive um, material and sensitive details. For example, quite common is um, that people study political topics in social media, which of course reveal a lot about the, people, um, the people's political orientation um, when 
they comment on uh, ongoing events or on the president or other topics. Um, still, this can be seen as something more public outreaching, but there's very intimate uh, details on online dating sites, for example. We will also have an example for that uh, in, the, um, in the upcoming uh, breakout room. Um, there's a detail on um, people being attacked in online context, for example, due to their race or sex. So there's really um, in-depth level of racist um, uh, uh, attacks on people and uh, this kind of has, has different implications. Um, people are sharing health information. So I, I've come across studies of uh, researchers collecting all X-ray images that are being shared on um, Twitter, for example, but people also share uh, ultrasound images of unborn babies uh, and lots of other um, health information or personal health material uh, in online environments. Um, sharenting is a new ter term um, coined for the context of people posting information about their kids online. So it's uh, from sharing and parenting. Um, so sharing uh, video footage of your kids, um, photo material of, of what your kids are doing and these kind of things in online environments. Uh, and um, protest movements, for example, are another case where we have uh, lots of issues when actual activists might be tracked down based on, on these kind of data and may face serious um, punishments in different uh, political contexts. Just examples of what there might be in this kind of data. And uh, next slide. Yeah, and now we, uh, I hand over to Oliver. So we will talk today uh, in this, in the room, if you want to join regression, but this was just to illustrate uh, a few contexts. Okay, thank you, Katrin. And um, the, the general points, I mean, you could probably come up with uh, some more uh, critical issues on the data we've just talked about or that Katrin has presented, but we will just talk or like present briefly five issues here. And one thing uh, a lot of people tend to forget that it's um, people behind the data. And so they, uh, scrape, they download whatever data is available and they can find that was a, a major issue over the past years, but there are always people behind this. And so in legal terms, we are talking about in a lot of cases, personal data. And uh, we will give, uh, um, let's say at least a glimpse because we don't have that much time in the breakout sessions today and on Thursday on what the legal framework is for this. Then um, a lot of the users uh, tweeting and posting and doing other stuff, they are not aware of that um, they are being researched on. So they, a lot of people are not seeing the second layer, so to say. So they think they send messages, photographs, posts, whatever, to their friends, to their, an, an intimate circle of people, but actually they're sharing it with the world, so to say. So that's another issue here. And then one thing that uh, researchers frequently say that, is, but the data is already public. If it's on Twitter, I can use it. Um, but then what does public mean? Uh, is it uh, uh, an online public or is it offline public? So um, uh, is it just the circle of people I tend to call my peers uh, or isn't it uh, the entire world if we talk about uh, social media platforms that have more than a billion users. And then uh, the next challenge, um, algorithms and computational methods. Uh, you're all aware of these like uh, terms like artificial intelligence, machine learning. So if you've got one picture, another picture, uh, you can compose them, you can find them. Uh, you might remember the case of Clearview in the United States, just like downloading millions of, uh, of images from Google. And then all of a sudden Google uh, calling on Clearview to delete these images, although Google was the place, the first place to, to collect them and probably do the same thing as Clearview, but uh, they will never tell you. 
and uh, recognizing people, all this kind of stuff, you, um, preventive policing and stuff. Uh, these are the next things you can do with the, this big masses of data, the big data. Um, and uh, all of a sudden, the dots you leave, the data points you leave around, they can be connected easily uh, because a lot of people, for example, tend to use the same IDs, the same aliases, the same usernames all over the place. And uh, uh, one thing that is, is also of importance is that uh, there is a growing awareness uh, in the research community. So people are uh, talking a lot about uh, research ethics, but uh, still there's little guidance, uh, probably no best practice yet. Although there are dozens, if not hundreds of studies and a lot of data sets are being uploaded on uh, repository uh, platforms. And there are no standards yet. So how, what do I do now? I do have this Twitter data set, this Facebook data set, this uh, Instagram data set, Reddit. Um, and now I want to hand it over to other researchers. How to do this? How do I document it? How do I preserve it and stuff? And all of a sudden I'm running into all these like ethical and legal issues after the fact. So make sure you do tell you the people you're training that they have to think about this before the fact. So it's part of the design phase. This is another thing we we're going to be talking about uh, the research data management, the life cycle of research data, and when you should be starting to think about these issues. And that's it from our side. So I'll stop sharing my slides and probably see you in uh, our breakout session.